I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Eve Watson, a psychoanalyst who writes on sexuality, poetics, film, and critical theory based in Ireland. Her recent book with Noreen Gifney is Clinical Encounters in Sexuality, Psychoanalytic Practice and Queer Theory from Punctum Books, 2017. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. So where would you like to begin? What comes to mind? Well, I suppose the first thing that comes to mind is that we're, you know, we're, we're in the time of this suspended time of the pandemic where things are so altered um, and the social link has been so changed by this um, in ways that we, as I think as psychoanalysts, we tend to plan things. We don't like to do things um, uh, without putting a good amount of thought into them, particularly when it comes to clinical matters um, uh, and how we organize our practice and, and, and uh, generally speaking. And we've had to adapt incredibly quickly to the necessities of the virus. And I suppose my, my thought is I'm so impressed by my colleagues, by their openness, their inventiveness, their creativeness, I, I have found it inspiring. And this idea that psychoanalysis is, you know, suspended in, in you know, the, the, the early 20th century and in the doldrums of, of, of uh, historic time, I think has been blown out of the water by the response of psychoanalysts to, and their commitment to practice. But also I've read some really good stuff. People are writing in very interesting ways about the about the pandemic and thinking about it in terms of the contemporary big other and which we always do as psychoanalysts the impact of the contemporary big other and this is uh, quite an impact so uh, that's my first thought that comes to mind um, notwithstanding the the very very difficult and horrific effects of the pandemic on individual lives and lived lives and and in ireland 1,700 families have been devastated by the loss of, of loved ones, and many, many others are very sick. Um, uh, so that, that, that's, that's real. But uh, I, just in terms of uh, acknowledging the, the field of psychoanalysis and its, I think, hitherto unrecognized adaptability, um, it's no longer unrecognized. Yeah, it's great. And I love how much um, community has developed. Like, for example, these courses that you've done uh, kind of to help analysts like talk about the experience of what's going on and the changes that everyone's making. Um, those have been really wonderful. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I, I'd love to. Um, and, and we loved seeing you there um, at, attending, um, uh, Vanessa. So, so this is the, the, the we, we put on a series of three webinars. This was well, we call them the, the three pandemic webinars, um, and it's an initiative by the, the Freud Lacan Institute, which is uh, was was established in two thousand and nineteen in Dublin, um, as a way of promoting psychoanalysis in Ireland and around the world. That it's that's its principal aim. It, its aim is to promote. Uh, psychoanalysis in Ireland and around the world, and uh, we we adapted to the exigencies of the uh, of the pandemic and thought 
look, let's, let's think about how we are working and let's come together. We organized these three, uh, these three webinars. 220 analysts from around the world attended the three webinars. And my, my understanding and my sense of it, and also this was uh, people said, there was a sense of communality and collegiality and coming together in, in this very difficult time. Um, uh, and that was important, as well as thinking through the impact on practice and how we can best manage it, as well as thinking about some of the limitations of moving to remote or online work. And we had some wonderful discussants who helped us to do that. We, for our first webinar, we had Paula Maielli and Ona Nirenberg, your colleagues in New York uh, from the APRECU Psychoanalytic Association there. For the second one, we had Danny Nobus needs no introduction. Um, and for the third one, we had Alan Rowan. Um, who's a member of ICLO and the NLS and, and, uh, and the WAP. Um, and so each of them brought a different perspective to thinking about the possibilities as well as some of the limitations of our work. But I think the overriding emphasis was on meeting the challenge, uh, supporting the work and engaging with the possibilities that, uh, that, uh, the, that, that this affords us. And, uh, I'm really glad that we did that. And it was a great way to launch the Institute as well. We, we weren't anticipating that this would happen or we would have this opportunity to launch ourselves. And, um, um, and we have, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's very nice. It, it's, it, 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 it's, it's independent. It doesn't support one particular Lacanian school or tradition or another. It's, it's about promoting the, the work of psychoanalysis around the world. It needs some promoting. I think our, is our is our overriding, <laughs> uh, um, uh, you know, uh, it, that, that, I suppose that, that that's our aim. It, it, psychoanalysis and psychoanalysts have not been good at promoting what they do, and we have all kinds of challenges uh, today more than ever with uh, with a, a psychoanalytic perspective and voice being included in anything that might be referred to as mainstream. We're so on the margins that if we don't end up promoting ourselves, um, I think the future might be rather grim. Yeah, and I think it's a really good time for psychoanalysis too, because I think a lot of people are really tired of like DSM diagnoses and how like completely ridiculous this has become where there's like 600 or 550 different diagnoses in there at this point. It's like anyone can find themselves in there. And people have retired, at least in the States, of being like over medicated and you know, the more people I talk to, people are really happy just to talk and have talk therapy and psychoanalytic thinking kind of coming back around and get out of this kind of behavioral medical model so much. And, and don't you think it was so interesting that uh, and pe you know, people are, are very smart. They, they recognize much of what is being, you know, pushed down their throats, I think. Um, the the during the pandemic, there was a, a much emphasis, and it really from the get-go, on um, a kind of management of well-being during the pandemic, that people could do, this was the message that was delivered from all across the media, you couldn't escape it on social media or sort of mainstream media, and it was sort of in, it was in the, the, the ether, that during the pandemic and people being at home, they can improve themselves, that they could you know, that they could study music or learn a language or knit, you know, 16 sweaters or whatever it might be. And people came to realize that this kind of super egoic, you know, injunction to, towards self-improvement um, was actually adding to their distress, not, not supporting it, not distracting them, even, not even distracting them, but in fact, making them feel worse. Um, and I think people very quickly um, just gave up on this and, 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 and stopped feeling bad about it. Um, and that's, of course, where psychoanalysis comes in, um, just in a very a general level. It doesn't make these kinds of demands around um, standards of health or well-being, um, which, of course, all of these these, uh, these uh, psychological and, and most of the psychiatric uh, approaches are based on, which are kind of standards or norms or ideals of health and well-being. The psychoanalysis allows room for the, for the person to be as well as they can be, given their 
resources, internal and external. That's, that's it. And that's, that's where we come in. And I think there's, it's really important that we do that today. As, as the world's resources become dis distributed more and more unequally, it's, 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 we're heading into difficult times where the, the differences between um, who has access to, to resources, and by resources I mean both internal and external, um, the, 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 the disparity between the haves and the have-nots will only increase if we don't do something about it. And I'm not sure I believe the, the hopeful optimism of some who say, oh, the pandemic is going to, it's going to change the world, it's going to change things. I'm not, I, I hope so, I'm not sure that it will. And there will be a very important place for psychoanalysis to allow the subject breathing space uh, in, 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 that, in the rather oppressive conditions of the postmodern world of, of uh, well, I suppose the, 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 the elimination of the subject that we understand as being divided, uh, the divided subject, that's, that's, that's our, our emphasis. And, and, and how uh, in the work that we do, the, the, the I suppose the freedom that comes from um, uh, allowing the divided subject to speak. That's, that's what we do, we facilitate that. And we see the effects of that on, on individuals. Yeah, and how much people really are not allowed to speak. You know, even in session, you can constantly see people t saying, you know, I know I shouldn't think this, I know I shouldn't say this, or just saying, I know that I'm like this. And it's like, who, like, who said that to you? Whose ideas are those? You know, they're so like ingrained and people are so identified with these ideas that have been placed upon them that when they start parsing it out, they realize maybe I don't think that about myself or maybe that isn't really me, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this, you know, uh, people are, are more aware of these things than they realize that, you know, once, once they're, the, a crack of light is offered about the, 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 the impress of these, uh, of these uh, um, injunctions, uh, people tend to, you know, eagerly wish to, to consider them um, and ultimately to, to be free of them. Certainly, that's my experience uh, in psychoanalytic practice. In any case, you know, again, it doesn't it doesn't take much. It's the and and our particular way of being trained and the kind of listening that we offer is unique. It is unique in in the world today that quiet, patient listening without any particular uh, goal or norm in mind that will allow for the person to speak. Uh, to what ultimately is most significant for them in their lives is sadly much more radical in this world than we would wish it to be. Yeah, it's really rare actually, and it is really sad. I feel I feel like that almost on a daily basis after after I've had sessions, it's like people just need space to speak. You know, they just need to be able to speak and to be listened to. And it's kind of shocking, you know, how how little people listen to each other. It, it is, and, and the world is noisy as well. It's getting noisier and noisier, um, and it's harder to switch it off. Um, uh, and um, people are busier, uh, and more is expected of them. Um, and I suppose one of the, one of the concerns that, that is, is there now, it's been there, but is more there now, perhaps, is that with people working from home, um, and, and, and many have been fortunate enough to be able to do that, um, that, that the separation between work and home will be increasingly eroded. Um, and it's very hard for people to, to switch off and say no, and the expectation is that they will be on all of the time. And it is very, very important that people have um, uh, you know, what used to be called leisure time, <laughs> time to themselves, you know, time to um, uh, uh, come out uh, themselves and, and the world a little bit, or not, if that's what they want to think about nothing, if, you know, uh, um, but, and not to have that is to, is to, tr is, is to, to, to treat people like uh, machines or robots, uh, you know, that, that they have, uh, you know, that they have, uh, 
uh, really no agency themselves. And, and we, I think we, we, we should be concerned about that. Um, and I suppose a quest, uh, 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 what I'm concerned with is that psychoanalysis has much to say as a discipline. Psychoanalysis has been of great interest to other disciplines from feminism to sexuality studies, to philosophy, uh, to cultural studies, critical theory, uh, literature, cinema and film studies, modern culture and media. Uh, psychoanalysis is a discipline that has been um, uh, used um, to very good effect and point to effect by these, these other disciplines and is very well recognized as such. Um, uh, and yet, uh, psychoanalysis is uh, slow to speak up for itself um, and, and there are reasons for that. Uh, we don't want to become too enmeshed in the big other and to be subsumed in the big other. That's, that's, I, I understand that. But at the same time, um, there is a, you know, there, that's an interesting contradiction between the, the status and the respect that psychoanalysis has interdisciplinarily, cross-disciplinarily. Um, and it's the sort of lowly status in terms of the, 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 the big other, the contemporary big other, the social cultural world. Um, and I think it would do well to speak up for itself and also to speak up on behalf of the suffering subject, because uh, if it doesn't, who will? Uh, what, cognitive behavioral therapy maybe? Uh, or well-being, or, or you know, these programs of, of well-being, um, uh, you know, are, are nothing. So, you know, it's, I, 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 my sense is that it's uh, becoming increasingly important that uh, that psychoanalysis articulate on behalf of the contemporary suffering subject. Yeah, and especially like you said, because there's no room, and like pe people know CBT, like it's everywhere. Like, look on any blog of like how to better your life, or you know how to be well, or how to be healthy, or how to be mindful, or whatever. It's like it's not something that you need to go to someone to learn. Uh, maybe like it was when it started. It's like every lifestyle health blog has like CBT and all these kinds of ideas mm -hmm. everywhere. So it's like you know, that could be some nice coping skill. Like, yeah, you might feel better if you go for a walk a few times a week. <laughs> it's like, not rocket science, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so people can find that information pretty easily and are inundated with it. So it's nice to have a space uh, that doesn't do that and isn't so advice giving. Mm. And, and people often come along to me and they'll say, okay, I want CBT. And I'll say, oh, okay, so can you just say what it is actually that you're, you're looking for? And they usually end up saying, well, I want to talk to somebody. And somebody has given them the idea that CBT is the way to go. But what they actually want is to talk to somebody. Um, so, you know, CBT has in Ireland is a big lobby and they've managed to very successfully, and one has to credit that, you know, uh, um, uh, make themselves into... Uh, uh, the place where doctors go, for example, when they're referring patients, they say, oh, you should go to CBT, you should have CBT. Um, and so clients come along, analysands come along and say, I want CBT. But that's what they want is, in fact, to speak um, and, uh, and for their suffering to be heard. So um, that's a very important to ask when somebody comes along uh, initially, ask them as, as we do, uh, inquire and ask what is it that they're looking for um, and not to be uh, in any way taken in by the the initial demand for CBT. Now in some cases it is an actual demand for CBT in which case an analysis is not appropriate but um, but also I find people come along to analysis having been through a course of CBT mm -hmm. and um, and have, it's worked for them perhaps for a time and then it's of course it's it doesn't work in so far as it doesn't address the the, the underlying issues um, and so their symptoms return in some form or other and sometimes worse. So people uh, find their way to, to analysts having been through the rounds of, of these other therapies. So, um, so, so we don't, maybe we don't have to worry too much about that uh, in that sense. Absolutely. So how did you all decide to form your group? Well, um, yeah, it's, 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 
it's I don't know how things work in 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 Sweden, and I know things are 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 quite regulated in the United States, for example. That's uh, regulated on a state by state basis. Sometimes analysts operate under the title of psychoanalyst in some states, and and in other states they don't. They they work as analysts, but their their title is social worker or psychologist or something something like this. It's anticipated in Ireland that the psychotherapy um, profession will be regulated in the next five years or so and will be regulated by the state. So one must, if one wants to operate a therapeutic practice uh, that is psychotherapeutically oriented, they'll have to do so under the title of psychotherapist. Um, so this will have an impact on, on those who, who work psychoanalytically. Um, and um, the, 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 the main group, the biggest group uh, that serves the interests of Freudian Lacanian psychoanalysts in Ireland is a group called API. That's the Association for Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy in Ireland. It's been around for 25 years or so. It was established by Cormac Gallagher, who of course is famous for translating, uh, who attended Lacan seminars and, and recorded them and has spent years translating them and whose work is invaluable to, to all of us um, here, here in Ireland. Um, and, uh, and so Appy was set up by, by Cormac and, 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 and a number of other analysts and has been going ever since. It, it, has, it, it took on, I think bravely, the mantle, and it, it, it's, in, it's in its name, the Association for Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy in Ireland. It took on the mantle of managing these two completely different disciplines. Um, uh, and, um, and, it, at the moment, is working closely with the umbrella bodies in Ireland around the the the, uh, the regulation of of psychotherapy and how psychoanalysis, with its unique ways of working, which does not fit well into standardised models that were that that typically characterised um, methods of of state uh, uh, state regulation. Um, so it's it's working carefully to manage that um, and um, is is I think is doing a good job and this is to ensure that psychoanalysts can work into the future that they're not barred from working uh, and that they will have a place in in uh, in the mental health world in Ireland in into the future um, so so fly the Freud Lacan Institute was set up in in, in principle to support Appy uh, which is very busy managing that work um, of, of, um, of ensuring that psychoanalysis has a place at the table of psychotherapy without necessarily losing itself in that process. And the Institute was set up to focus exclusively on the discourse of psychoanalysis uh, and its many, uh, its many uh, characteristics and, 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 uh, and aspects and promoting it and to take over that side of things. So it has a very close relationship with Appy. Um, all uh, uh, the, the four members of the board and myself, we're all members of Appy um, and we, we promote Appy you know, heavily in what we do and we're very happy to, and Appy has been very important in helping us to get established. Um, and um, uh, but our, uh, we, we're very happy to take on the uh, the aim of promoting psychoanalysis and ensuring that the voice of psychoanalysis um, is extended further into 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 the world in whatever ways it can. Um, and so uh, so we're very pleased that the seminars so far have announced the, 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 the existence of the Institute and, and our analyst colleagues around the world have, have some idea of its existence now. And now the work will turn, it will, that work will continue, but we're, 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 we're organizing a couple of initiatives, like for example, an introductory course, a short course in fundamentals in psychoanalysis for people that want an accessible introduction to psychoanalysis. It sounds like a very simple thing to do, but it's not been done before, um, um, certainly in Ireland. Um, or people who might like a refresher, you know, to say, oh, right, I think I'd like a, a couple of hours on psychosis or on, on the psychoanalysis of groups or, or something like that. And, and we're also then looking at something that, to my knowledge, hasn't been done before anywhere. I could stand to be corrected now on this, but uh, a, a, a longer course on supervision, uh, studying 
together supervision specifically in the Freudian Lacanian tradition. And that is a rather complicated uh, uh, business, this, this notion of supervision, which is so rooted in our understanding of both transference, but also the transmission of psychoanalysis. Uh, and so we intend on, on organizing a course in that uh, in, uh, uh, in the autumn, in, in the fall of 2020 and into 2021. It probably will run over the course of a, of a year, an academic year. And I think we, with, uh, with the way things are with the pandemic, we may be able to open that up to people from wherever if we do it by uh, through an online platform. So the idea is that we would have very experienced analysts from different parts of the world who would guide us through a series of, of, uh, of, of guided of, of discussion seminars to, to explore together supervision specifically from a Freudian Lacanian perspective. I have to say I'm excited about that. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, like the idea of, the, of, of a rigorous study of supervision. Uh, uh, and I think it will be fundamental to our thinking about the transmission of psychoanalysis, because I suppose that's an overriding theme here, the transmission of psychoanalysis. What, what's going to happen to psychoanalysis? How is it transmitted? Um, and uh, if we sit on the sidelines and do nothing, which we can do, um, it's not going to get transmitted by itself. <laughs> so that, I'm sorry to be, say something so incredibly obvious, but, or it will be transmitted by, by those that, with messages that maybe we're not very comfortable with. I mean, look at the Netflix thing on Freud, which was, you know, catastrophically bad. <laughs> and some of my students were asking me, should I watch that? And I said, no, don't watch that. Please don't watch that. Um, watch something else. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, this is, we, we, we're up against it. We're up against it. Yeah, I had someone uh, named Mary Wild who does like the series at the Freud Museum called Projections. Um, and she talks about like cinema through a psychoanalytic lens. So I had her on to talk about the Noit Freud show. And she described it as fan fiction. It was like they just took Freud and like wrote fan fiction about him. <laughs> that was kind of funny. But yeah, it's like blood orgies and the occult and detective stories. And then Danny Novus, I talked to Danny Novus when I was watching it. And I was like, what is this? And he's like, oh, have you read this book, The 7% Solution that somebody wrote in the 70s? It's like, a Sherlock Holmes novel written, written where like Sherlock Holmes and Freud go on a detective uh, solving mystery story and they're both like drinking 7% solution, <laughs> like drinking cocaine the whole time. So now I'm reading that. I'm, I've, I've gone off on this tangent because of that show. <laughs> that is, that is hilarious. <laughs> Like we laugh and we, you know, we, we recognize how ridiculous this is, but some people actually believe this stuff. Um, right. You know, if it's on, it, it, it must be true. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually familiar with Mary, Mary Wilde's um, Freud Museum um, events. In fact, I've been along to some of her, her projections film events and I really enjoy those. Um, and in fact, the Lars von Trier one is coming up this weekend. Yeah, I'm doing uh, it. Good, me too. Yeah. Well, great, I'll see you there. <laughs> Today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And there's one coming up on the uncanny. I think we both voted in favor of the uncanny. Yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> well done, Mary Wilde. And, and she's great. And, and there's a lovely example of presenting really interesting film work, but making it accessible using, you know, some very difficult psychoanalytic concepts in some cases. And it is, you know, it, it is accessible and it's interesting and she does a great job. So, you know, that's, that's, you know, it, there's a good example of how it can be done. Yeah, and, and getting the and ideas through, out to a general public. Exactly, but also through your own work as well, of course, Vanessa, in these podcast series and in other things you do, you are, as I understand it, and you can correct me on this, you are an interdisciplinarian, that you, 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 you see a value in, in thinking psychoanalysis sometimes in relation to other disciplines. Now, that's rooted in the fundamentals of Freud uh, and Lacan. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I think um, I've, I've had some discussions with colleagues about, about this, uh, uh, this, this business of, 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 and for me, the importance of being able to, if you're not able to think about psychoanalysis and some essential concepts in psychoanalysis in relation to other ways of thinking about those concepts, I'm not sure that you really know them. Um, uh, yet I do find that in, in some 
uh, in some places in the broad field of Freudian Lacanian psychoanalysis, there's a reluctance to, to, to you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a tendency towards a kind of purification of the, of, uh, of the, of the concepts, of the writing, of clinical practice. Um, and you know, as if, as if uh, the, 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 those fundamentals could be um, contaminated in some way by their, uh, by their connection to other disciplines. Um, and I don't subscribe to that idea. Um, I, I think I understand where it comes from, but I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. I think it, it does take extra work uh, to, to uh, know your concept well and then to be able to study a different approach to it and then to be able to think them together. Um, uh, uh, I, I do see a value to that. Uh, not everybody shares that perspective. I, I do understand that. Um, and I also understand the, the, the wish to protect psychoanalysis and not have it be um, you know, thought of in, in, in some ways, the application of psychoanalytic concepts in other disciplines has transformed them. But that's in other disciplines. And, uh, and clinical psychoanalysis in particular is, uh, is, um, uh, is, is, is fine. And, and certainly the, I, see, I see evidence of more and more and more rigor in, in the field of, of clinical psychoanalysis. Um, and I've, I've also been very impressed jumping from topic to topic now, by the writing that has been done um, over the last number of years, but, but some very good writing around the, uh, the pandemic as well by analysts. I, have you seen any, any writings? Uh, oh yeah, century? right away it was coming out. Mm, mm, mm. It is, and, and you know, Freud was adamant that, that clinical practice is supported by a clinic of writing. That, that they go together. Um, and um, I, I value that immensely. I'm the editor of a journal uh, called Lacune, um, uh, which is a peer reviewed journal uh, in, in Lacanian, Freudian Lacanian psychoanalysis. Um, and it's just, uh, it's, it's a great privilege to be able to encourage people to write and to be able to facilitate a clinic of writing such that a journal can do, this comes out a couple of times a year. Um, and to be able to, to not only provide that means for, for practicing analysts and, 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 and in some cases theoreticians of psychoanalysis, uh, to uh, make their work available uh, uh, and give them that opportunity, but, but also how important it is for us to read and keep up and to be, as Lacan put it, practitioners of the symbolic. That's, you know, we, the onus is on us to, to keep up and, uh, and keep up with what's happening uh, in the symbolic. And that's a mighty task sometimes to keep up uh, because it seems to be changing uh, in, all the time, um, for sure. But certainly the writings I've seen in relation to the pandemic, some really good work on mourning and me memorialization I've gone back to reading Freud's Morning and Melancholia on several occasions over the last couple of months, mm -hmm. indispensably for my own clinical practice, but also just for the time that we're in. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, just that, that essay in particular uh, resonates. Uh, it's always resonated with me. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, pieces by Freud at Morning and, uh, and Melancholia. Um, and... and uh, um, and, and, and some very interesting subsequent writers on, on, uh, on mourning um, as well. Uh, and you know, that, that is one thing uh, that, that psychoanalysis does in particular and, and where uh, we, can, we can think of it as contributing, I think, to uh, a deficit in the big other, which is to make a place available to the real of death, uh, and to and to loss um, um, and how important that is that we give that uh, it, as much articulation as it can get um, uh, and we we know uh, as well that there is a point at which articulation fails in relation to to loss and to death but to mark that as well the, the point at which articulation stops whether we think of that in terms of the navel of the dream or we think of that as, uh, I think, Freud's response to the death of his daughter, Sophie, um, uh, from when she died uh, uh, as a result of the, the Spanish flu in 1919. Um, uh, there's very little to say, I'm paraphrasing there now. Or, or Virginia Woolf in to, to the Lighthouse. 
um, where there's literally three dots she has as, as a reference to the death of her mother, which I think for, for those of us interested in, in, in Virginia Woolf's work, and I, I count myself as one such person, uh, her mother was very important to her and the death of her mother is captured into the lighthouse by three dots. So, but it is nonetheless marked and it is, it is uh, uh, allowing for that, those very important processes to occur. I, I think that's a very important component of psychoanalytic practice and psychoanalytic work. And the writings that I've seen um, many of my colleagues produce and admired is also part of our own mourning process as well. Um, and, and, uh, we are also members of, of, of the larger community, uh, human race, planet Earth, and, uh, and are affected, each and every one of us, by what's happening in the world. And it, it has been tough. Um, just bringing up literature reminded me that last year I went to Ireland for the first time, and I just loved how much literature is like so integrated in the culture. Of course, there are so many literary giants coming from there, but I love that it's just like everywhere you know it's like everybody is like really appreciative of this literature literary heritage it was amazing oh what a lovely observation by you and, and i'm i'm so delighted that you you were able to come to to ireland um last summer um it's true and i was only saying to one of my uh, my friends my american friends um uh, over the weekend I, I studied, I went to university in America, so I, I, I have strong connections to, to the United States and a number of very good friends there. And I was saying to her, I was, we were talking about the lit, uh, Irish literary heritage and, and people are very proud. We're a very proud people of our literary heritage. Now this is foremost in our minds because it is the end of June and of course, the 16th of June is Bloomsday. <laughs> and the, uh, it, it, we really celebrate it here that, that you know this is the day that marks the the, the famous day of of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, Stephen Daedalus's sojourn through the streets of Dublin as captured by Joyce and Ulysses, um, and it's a it's a celebration, and we even managed to celebrate it during the pandemic with people getting dressed up and and um, and all kinds of podcasts and and many of our. Uh, actors and, and and musicians contributing to readings of the of the text and and we, we really love it um, and um, it, it's it is one of the things I think that characterizes Dublin is you go to a coffee shop or you go to a pub and it won't be long before someone has something to say about our literary history whether it's uh, you know, you know and, and we have great women writers as well the the Museum of Literature in Ireland uh, uh, and it's appropriately, its acronym is MOLLY, <laughs> Museum of Literature in Ireland, um, opened up um, recently uh, in the last couple of years. And um, um, in fact, the Freud Lacan Institute is going to have an event with in, in, in the museum next year. Um, uh, but they, they, it's a lovely place to go to, to capture some of the, the literary heritage of, of Ireland in, in a lovely space. Um, uh, there, um, but certainly, yes, it's 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 uh, you know it's uh, it is uh, very nice. For example, to do the Joyce walking tour of Dublin. I don't know if you got a chance to do that, or as you walk around Dublin, you'll see little plates on the ground mm -hmm. that that capture um, you know a, a, a quote or a sentence um, uh, from uh, from Ulysses and and mark the spot that 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 line refers to. Um, and um, it's uh, it's very nice, so it's it's hard to escape it. But it is one lovely aspect of our and our literary heritage is tied in to I suppose our emancipation um, that we you know we maintained an interest in classical education. Um, um, uh, we 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 emerged as a free state in 1922, which is very recent. Mm -hmm. um, but prior to that. Um, uh, schools were, uh, uh, the mainstream schooling um, wasn't easily accessible if, uh, if you were Catholic. Um, and most parents did not want to send their children to state schools um, because, uh, because of the possibility of, 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 uh, of uh, that, their, their, the, that their Catholic ethos would be eroded in doing that. And, and that was a very realistic um, uh, possibility. So most of our education happened literally under the hedges. Uh, hedge schools, as they were called, these were illegal schools um, run in outhouses and under the hedges, right. but it was rooted in a classical education. 
um, and um, and th and that that you know that that went on for 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 a, a long time, for hundreds of years, um, and um, and and since the the foundation of the Free State, uh, there's there's that the importance of 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 education. Um, and we're considered, I suppose, to be a very educated society here, and there's been an emphasis on it, has continued. Um, and our, 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 our emphasis on, 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 on our literary tradition as, as capturing something fundamental, it is, it, is, it is actually connected in with the founding, with the founding. I mean, W.B. Yeats was involved in, 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 uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the first... Uh, uh, in the first years of the of the free state, actively and politically, so you know that 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 tells you uh, a lot about that. That's so great. Yeah, I really yeah. loved Ireland right. a lot. I loved it more than I even expected to. <laughs> really? Yeah, oh I just loved God. it. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Did you did you did you get outside of Dublin, or were you entirely in Dublin? Yeah, we went to the outskirts. The the museum that we were the gallery that we were playing in was uh, called Rua Red and I guess it was still like technically Dublin but it wasn't in the center it was like outside of the center but I have a friend that uh, is at the university in Cork and so she's going to do a conference maybe next year <laughs> that was the plan we'll see um, but I would love to go there because I all the pictures that I've seen that she posts just look incredible Oh yes, and uh, the, Ireland is very different outside of Dublin, and I think you'll you'll enjoy that contrast. And Cork, I'll just give you a heads up, is referred to as the People's Republic of Cork. It's the biggest county, very proud group of people, a very distinctive accent, um, and uh, and UCC is a beautiful campus, so and a very old campus. So I do hope that uh, that comes to pass. And please send out you know, notices and, of, I mean, you're very good about, about uh, sending out notices of, the, of the, the many events that you organize, some of which I suppose have had to be canceled um, because of the, of the pandemic, but hopefully by next year, things will be coming back on, on track. Yeah, we'll see. But I think one of the reasons why I asked about your group as well is because you mentioned like promoting psychoanalysis around the world. And that's what, something I've been trying to think about is like, with this technology, we're able to connect with people all over the world. Like this conference I was a part of a few weeks ago called the Psychology of Global Crises. I mean, our panel, you know, we had people in like Cairo and people in Australia, New Zealand, and then like Denmark and then California, and like sometimes all in the same panel. And it's amazing how they could speak to each other in real time without any lag or anything, you know, from like all over the world. So I've been trying to think about like how we can have more of a global network, um, you know, psychoanalytically and, and stay connected with people that all like um, want to work together and promote psychoanalysis because of course there's like institutes and groups like in every local area. But um, part of the reason why we started Umbahagen in New York was because all the institutes stayed so kind of insular and, and even in New York weren't talking to each other. And we were like, why, why don't we all talk like cross disciplinarily, cross-disciplinarily in the field, you know, it's just like a uh, Kleinian talking to a Lacanian, you know, <laughs> so it's not that big of a jump, but um, even if we could just be Lacanian, Freudian Lacanians talking uh, from different places or something like that, it's something that I'm really interested in seeing how we can keep that going even after the pandemic ends, if, you know, that even, I don't know, who knows when that will be. It's a great idea, and we we recognise this as an island nation in Ireland. That we we've always had to go outside of the island uh, for most things. When we started to open up properly as a country, because we as a country we've been rooted in. I should say, I gave a very happy, glowing picture of the literary, literary tradition of Ireland, but we've also been um, um, under the under the under the cosh of of Catholicism for a very long time until recently. Um, uh, now, th that, that has uh, changed radically in the last 10 years because we've gone from being one of the most conservative and Catholic countries in Europe to being one of the most progressive in, in between 2010 and 2020. 
uh, so much so that people are asking what's happening in Ireland with given that equal marriage was voted in by a referendum of the people of Ireland by a large majority in 2015 and also abortion uh, was legalized um, uh, and our and our divorce was legalized um, in uh, in 2018 came into force in 2019 and also our divorce laws have uh, we have divorce <laughs> uh, we've had that for a while but that 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 has also been uh, made easier for people and that's happened in the last couple of years so um so you know in in, in some countries things are, are heading towards a, a closing up and, and a conservatism but in ireland things are opening up um and that that has a connection to to uh, to Catholicism having less of an of a, of, a, of an influence um, in in the country, um, it continues to have an influence, but but less so. Um, um, and uh, I, I, you know, as as we've always looked to uh, at the beginning of all of that, we really was in the late '60s when, as a country, we started to look to the OECD and what and this and the Europe and what would become the European Union. Uh, for guidance, for influence, and we opened ourselves up as an island to uh, to other influences, and we've benefited enormously from that uh, over the last 50 years or so. So, uh, psychoanalytically, we've always, of course, with the tradition of that we've inherited from Freud uh, in Austria, from Lacan in France. Those, you know, we, we of, of course, this is uh, we 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 we've looked to to uh, to these. Uh, these founders of, of psychoanalysis outside of the country, but we, we've always understood psychoanalytically the importance of, of that we can be insular as an island. It's, it's inevitable that we will be so. Um, and that if we are to keep psychoanalysis fresh, alive, up to date, and, uh, and to make sure that we don't relax into a complacency. Um, and I, and you know, and I'm not, I don't, think our analysands particularly allow us to do that anyway but just so that we don't as a as a group uh, we've we have always been uh, involved with with other groups and and had speakers come in from abroad go to events the Irish are the Irish are the Hiberno Lacanians as we're uh, rather lovingly referred to by our international colleagues uh, we show up at conferences uh, we, we, we we for many years we went to Colette Solaire's forums uh, which is uh, a Lacan in English in Paris and uh, old fleet of, of Irish Lacanians would have said regularly go to uh, to Paris, to London, to Ghent, of course our, our wonderful colleagues in Ghent uh, there, Paul Verhaka, Stane Van Heurel and, and a number of others. Um, and uh, and of course the, the United States uh, as well. Um, and and uh, and I've 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 always taken an interest in Lacanian psychoanalysis in the in the United States and uh, the particular challenges that are there for Lacanian psychoanalysis to exist in the, in the, in, in in the U.S. Um, uh, it's uh, it, it's it's always struck me as as perhaps being even more challenged, you know, given given the emphasis on on individualism and uh, and late capitalism in in America. Uh, you know, the fact that Lacanian psychoanalysis exists and it's growing is very significant, and uh, so we have something to learn from that too. Yeah, and here in Sweden, there there is a Lacanian who was trained in France, uh, named Per Magnus Johansson, and he's in Gothenburg, so it's like a three three hours away. And I've talked to him, and I was on a panel with him at a conference last year. Um, and then he's like trained, you know, a few people, like three people, I think, maybe more. But I've met like three people. It's a very small group in a city on the other side of Sweden, <laughs> three hours away. Um, and that's it. Uh, I talked to the Swedish Psychoanalytic Association. They are not at all interested in Lacan. Um, so there's no, there's no English speaking group at all uh, here. So I guess I'm also asking for selfish reasons of like, how can I participate? <laughs> um, I would love to take, if you guys see these classes online, like over the next academic year, I would love to take those. That would be amazing. Well, and we would love to have you involved. And 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 uh, you know, I've I've heard you speak at conferences, and I'm I'm familiar with the work that you do. And we'd love to have anything that you might contribute uh, to to our work. I, I, that would be that would be wonderful. Um, and if for heaven's sake, would you organize something in Sweden? Because I've never been. 
and uh, and I'd love to go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That when when we can, I will for sure. <laughs> absolutely, and and you know, could we go back to the, to the question of uh, the, uh, that you posed so eloquently of of the importance of psychoanalytic groups um, being willing to work with each other, to take an interest in each other's work. Um, I, I do think that that is uh, very important. Um, and the, certainly in my experience, um, I've, I've learned a great deal uh, and uh, found the work of colleagues in other places to be invaluable. Um, from hearing about how they manage their clinical practices to um, to how they how they put Freud's theory and Lacan's theory to work in the context of their perhaps their particular uh, group, um, uh, but also in their clinical practices. It's also very interesting to hear about how other psychoanalytic groups work and function. Uh, now, this could be in great danger here of going down the road of the challenges of the psychoanalytic group uh, and how uh, the history of psychoanalysis, the history of Freudian and Lacanian psychoanalysis is, is a history of, of groups in, in many ways and, uh, and uh, the formation of groups. And so I think this, the psychoanalytic study of groups is, is very important because most of us are either have been part of a group or are currently part of a group or perhaps even more than one group. And it's a very strange business that psychoanalytically we work with the singularity of the speaking subject. And most of us beaver away in practice on our own. And it's, a, you know, it's quite a, 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 an isolated business in a way. And yet uh, for many, there is the significance of the psychoanalytic group um, which brings together these individuals who describe themselves in some kind of way as, psychoanal as psychoanalysts or psychoanalytic psychotherapists. And, um, and, uh, and the group uh, offers, offers different things. It depends on the group. Um, uh, our group offers a coming together uh, and, uh, around fundamental psychoanalytic themes uh, of, of the moment often and, uh, um, and, and looks to broaden and support people's interest in, in, uh, in, in, um, in, in, in contemporary psychoanalytic practice. Um, but groups, psychoanalytic groups really have struggled with managing um, uh, the, the dynamics of, of bringing psychoanalytic practitioners who in their own way are kind of lone wolves anyway, um, insofar as they've chosen to work psychoanalytically um, uh, and, um, and, and making room for, for the psychoanal psychoanalyst as a lone wolf. Groups do that, uh, good working groups do that. Um, but then they're all, you know, they're, they're, psychoanalytic groups are no different to, to the tensions and challenges of any other group around uh, the leader of a group, tensions and ideals in relation to the leader of the group, group dynamics, and the, and the famous splitting uh, of groups and, and arguments between groups is part of the history of psychoanalysis. Um, um, and I found, I've taken an interest in that over, over the, the last number of years, and it's, it's part of being interested in our history. Um, we, 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 we've also had some, some splits in Dublin. Um, Dublin is not immune from that either, um, and, uh, and will, will not be immune from it in the future. Yeah, I think that would be a great thing to talk about. And one of the things we wanted to talk about at this conference we were supposed to do in Copenhagen this summer on uh, psychoanalysis, we called it community and culture, and um, talking about like the psychoanalytic groups and the development of that like historically, but also like where psychoanalysis stands now as like a collective and like what our place is with each other and what our place is in the culture and that sort of thing. It would be mm -hmm. great to be able to talk about that more, I think. Oh, that sounds great. Um, it, 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 it really does. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I, I, please let me know about that. <laughs> I'd be very interested uh, in, in, in that. Um, yeah, I, I suppose it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it's not, it's not an easy area to, to 
important uh, to, to study and engage with. Um, because there's also, of course, the, uh, the element of the political. Um, it's groups um, um, have a political aspect to them. All groups do, in my view. Um, and, and sometimes that's not always articulated clearly, and sometimes it is. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a rather complicated, complex area, but of course that doesn't put us off one bit. It probably makes us even more interested because it's complicated and complex. Um, but uh, yes, um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think again, um, it's, it's, I think we, we would learn a lot from, from, uh, from a sustained piece of work uh, in that area. Um, and yes, please, please, please do let me know about it. Yeah, well, it sounds like you've already been thinking about it. Well, yes, we well, we have because because uh, because we set up the institute and and so we were very mindful of thinking about the groups that exist in Dublin, and there are a number of Lacanian groups already in Dublin, uh, which is you know, we're a small country, <clears throat> we're about four and a half million people. There's one million people or approximately who live in Dublin, and um, there are. Um, there are three now four Lacanian groups <laughs> in Dublin, uh, which is which is a lot. Amazing. Uh, it's it, it 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 really is. And there are across the island of Ireland thirteen separate psychoanalytic groups, north and south of the border, um, which is also a lot. Now some of them are very very small, and many of them are very very small. Um, but it really does give a, a flavour of. Um, of, um, of both the interest in psychoanalysis um, north and south of the border in, in Ireland, but also quite an interest in Lacanian psychoanalysis in Dublin. Um, but we, we had to think very carefully about where the Institute would fit in in that landscape. Um, and, um, and we thought about it for a long time, actually. Um, and for a number of years, we didn't just suddenly, you know, get together in a few weeks and, and come up with this. Um, that we really listened to the psychoanalytic community here. We engaged with them. Um, it wasn't always easy to do that, uh, but we had meetings, we had open fora. Um, we talked about the raison d'etre for setting up, what, why would you set up another group? What would, what would it do? Um, and we listened and, and we formulated from those discussions um, an understanding that there is a place and in fact a crucial place for a group that will um, uh, uh, advocate at for, for, psych, for Lacanian psychoanalysis in Ireland and beyond. Um, and it can do so without in any way getting in the way of the work of other groups, the other groups in, in Dublin. Um, and it, and it, it, it can do that. And in fact, it can support the work of those other groups in Dublin and beyond. That that is its that that is, and and already I'm I, uh, I I'm I'm seeing good good signs of that. Um, so um, so we'll see how it goes. But um, um, so we've had to think about uh, groups and in particular the history of, of groups in the in the Lacanian field in particular, um, and 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 really think about the history of Lacanian psychoanalysis in Dublin. And I've, I've, and, and I've had many conversations and I've, I've learned a lot about it. And it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, we, we understand the importance of history in, in the psychic life of, 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 of the subject. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's, 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 it has been, it has been uh, very interesting. Um, and uh, uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's uh, we're not a school. We, we've we've named ourselves the Freud Lacan Institute with a small I for Institute. Our acronym is FLY, um, uh, and we've come up with a with a fly buzzing around. You know, the idea of buzzing in the ear is is I think one that that that, that suits our aims and and in intentions. Um, and um, we're not. We came. We came up with the uh, with Signifier Institute because we want to distinguish ourselves from school. Um, and there is a, a school of Lacanian psychoanalysis in Dublin, the Irish School for Lacanian Psychoanalysis. And there's also the uh, there's a, a group called the Circle. There's the Irish Circle for for, uh, you know, for for Lacanian psychoanalysis as well. So so Institute uh, is a signifier that distinguishes us. Um, and we, we gave it a small I um, uh, to highlight the fact that it's not a traditional institute. 
uh, in the sense that it's very different from the, the famous or the infamous psychoanalytic institutes of America uh, and the UK. Um, but that it might also be looking to do something new because institute is not, not a signifier that's really used in Ireland, particularly in the field of Lacanian psychoanalysis. So it's, so it's pointing towards the new and the creative and, and the different. That's, that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do here. Nice. And I don't want to keep you know. too, I don't want to keep you too long, but I do think also what you brought up before of like working interdisciplinarily is really important as well. And, and how Freud and Lacan both did that, you know, they both pulled from all sorts of disciplines and applied psychoanalytic theories to different uh, disciplines, whether it was literature, the arts or the sciences or whatever. Um, and I think that's a way really to keep psychoanalysis really alive and vibrant and creative, like you said. I, I read recently that, that Lacan had more than 500 books on Joyce when he was writing his seminar on Joyce and the Santum. 500, I mean, if that doesn't put the fire under us, I don't know what does. <laughs> Amazing. Was there anything else you wanted to mention? Um, I, no, I don't think so. I just, uh, uh, just I suppose it, 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 it seems fitting to at this time. And I would like to wish all of my colleagues uh, out there uh, in this time of pandemic the very best um, uh, and look forward to seeing them in person uh, and especially yourself uh, seeing you in person soon, as soon as, as, as we can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that, that, that I've been hearing a lot about since I've been doing this and talking to different people that I didn't know, you know, in person, in vivo, um, is this whole area of decolonial psychoanalysis that I hadn't really heard about when I was in New York. Um, but it's basically people working to kind of dismantle the really like Western medical model mind frame that even infiltrated psychoanalytic thought, I guess, mostly through like ego psychology in America. Um, and trying to bring in other perspectives, including like indigenous perspectives and of course, Franz Fanon um, and that sort of thing. And so there seems to be people that they're, they're also uh, kind of averse to, they're not necessarily Lacanian, but they're averse to psychoanalytic institutes because that's where you know, the institutional structure thrives on these kinds of issues. Um, and creates them. So they're kind of operating outside of psychoanalytic institutes from this sort of decolonial framework. And I think that sounds really interesting as well. It does. Uh, it sounds very interesting. And it's pointing up to some of the institutional and systemic problems that have plagued psychoanalysis since the death of Freud. Um, and, um, and, and, and that has had an effect on us. Um, and um, I, I think you, you know, I, I don't want to, to speak out of turn, Vanessa, but I think you can actually speak directly to that from your own experience, um, as I recall. Um, so, you know, we've had to work hard to come out of the shadow of institutionalized psychoanalysis. And of course, Lacan was such a breath of fresh air. He upended um, in, you know, in institutionalized uh, psychoanalysis um, with, um, with its uh, post-Freudian introduction of, of systematized and formulaic ways of training analysts and of working with, uh, with Freud's concepts, etc. And you know, that, that fresh air that he brought to, uh, to psychoanalysis uh, is, is the fresh air that we breathe and that we continue to breathe. Um, and that I think is incumbent on us to, um, to, to, uh, to pass on, to, to allow others uh, at, to access that if, uh, if, they, if they're interested in it um, and, uh, and to promote it. Um, and, uh, but also in, if I may continue this air metaphor that, you know, to make sure that we don't become stale in our thinking, um, and that we, you know, we continue to breathe in, um, some of the, uh, the, these very, very important ideas that are being formulated in other disciplines. Um, and I'm, I am very interested in this field of post-colonial studies. I was interested for a number of years in queer theory. In fact, um, as a way of, of, of thinking about sexuality, um, um, which has a tendency, I think, towards reification in the field. 
Um, and in fact, I ended up putting together a, a, an edited collection with Noreen Giffney uh, called uh, 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 um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Clinical Encounters in, in, in Sexuality, Psychoanalytic Practice and Queer Theory. And it brings together psychoanalysts from across the field of psychoanalysis, so not just Lacanians, but also queer theorists and specialists in, 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 in sexuality as studies, to engage in a series of encounters and dialogues. That's what the book does. Um, to address some of the tendencies towards, towards reification in, in the field um, and, and also to look at the legacy and history of, of psychoanalysis, um, um, which is not a happy one in, 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 in relation to, for example, homosexuality. This is not, not, not specifically in the Lacanian field, obviously, but in institutionalized uh, psych uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, um, and particularly in the Anglophone world. So, um, so, so any, any effort to disentangle um, our tendency, and there is a tendency towards reification. We're not great at adapting to change as human beings. And we are inflected by, by dominant perspectives, by what the master discourses of the day as people living in the world. So uh, engagement um, um, with, the, with the kinds of, of questions that some of these disciplines offer, like post-colonial studies, um, should, I, I think, certainly it has for me, but I like the idea that it opens the window a bit and lets in a bit of fresh air into our, into our psychoanalytic thinking and work um, and, uh, uh, and allows us to, to ponder things uh, uh, perhaps a little bit more carefully and incisively. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Eve Watson. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated. Yeah.
not hard enough, but I tried. There are doorways I haven't opened, and windows I've yet to look through. Going forward may not be the answer. Maybe I should go back. If I don't know who I am, I might find out who I was.